Okay, thank you to everybody. So we are here to work with the organizers and And it's the first time I come to uh, Asada, of course, which is an excellent uh, uh, you know, novelty to me. But it's also the first time I come to Ukraine. Uh, because as I was studying uh, at Chester this morning, actually, I'm not, uh, I don't know whether you will be disappointed by this, but I'm not really a specialist for my presentation theory. My background is uh, half in philosophy and half in computer science, logic for computer science. And I, uh, and I use this, I mean, this is quite useful for my book, when I speak to a, a philosophical audience, I tell them, if I say something wrong, you know, forgive me because I'm a computer scientist. If I talk to a computer scientist community and say, well, forgive me, I'm a philosopher. And this usually puts people in the right mood to listen to what uh, I want to convey, which is not technical things, but uh, rather general ideas. Since I have no idea of uh, uh, actually the ground, I mean, I know that, uh, of course, uh, this. Uh, a kind of logic related conference, but I have no idea of, of the background of the people who have the tutorial. Uh, for give me once again if something things uh, look very trivial to you, okay? Okay. Anyway, as I said, uh, uh, what I want to convey is uh, uh, some general ideas about why I think that actually argumentation theory is one of the most uh, Exciting things which is happening, which has been happening over the last uh, 20, 20, yeah, do was in his PhD, 90 something, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, even 80s. But uh, yeah, okay. from the last yeah. 20, 25 years, even for the So I will uh, um, try to explain why we might be able to do this argumentation for, for people who nowadays call on the argumentation term. This type of paradigm shift, which is quite interesting. Then I will not speak about new argumentation frameworks in the sense of, Aston, of the abstract semantics, because we're just as well covered the subject. Uh, but I will just quickly uh, review the things that Francesca said. And then I will tell you, talking about structure uh, argumentation, okay, which is not just uh, uh, arguments are not just abstract points that are connected in graph. By means of, uh, uh, by means of, of, of uh, links and arrows, but uh, uh, arguments are, are actually those, those like that kind of things that we use in everyday argumentation practice, I mean, things in which we try to persuade an interlocutor or we try to find, uh, find a solution to a problem. And uh, I will explain why I think the natural reaction, which is an approach logic uh, that is not very popular in computer science departments because it's uh, definitely uh, no, computer science department the most popular approach among people who do recruiting is either the solution or uh, couple of or simple couple. I mean natural reflection they think uh, wrongly in my opinion that it's not uh, uh, amenable to uh, automation is not true, I'm mean, trying to, to show that in fact it depends on how you approach it. But the advantage of natural deduction, it was proposed by, by Gensen in the, 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 the mid-30s, oh, exactly because he wanted to come up with a formal system of logic that would be as close as possible to the way people, well in this case mainly mathematicians, actually reason when they want to show something. Right? And uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with natural deduction. Can you, can you raise your hand if you are familiar with natural deduction? Very, very few, which is okay. Which means that my talk is safe. I mean, it's not entirely good okay? And then I will uh, show, um, I will show, um, I will talk briefly about this rationality postulates which were put forward uh, in 2007. And then again, in 2012, by Caminarda, uh, Amgud, uh, Carnelli, and Dunn, right? Yeah. Uh, you and I mean, the first ones were just Caminarda and Amgud. Yeah, the first one, Caminarda and Amgud. The, the, the second one was Carnelli and this. Uh, <coughs> yeah. 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 
all kinds of things. And, uh, and, and then we got explained, and, <clears throat> I mean, what, 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 I mean, roughly speaking, what they consist of. Then I will not speak uh, about briefly, of course, about this problem, which is related uh, to, to uh, a lot of uh, computational problems that are uh, people who try to work with uh, argumentation theory uh, have to face, which is the problem that, in fact, uh, logic in general is idealized. I mean, it's uh, it's okay for agents with rational agents with unlimited resources, but logical models cannot be applied as they are to agents with bounded resources. So how can we face this problem, which is important not only from the theoretical viewpoint, as you will see, but also from the practical viewpoint, because if you are going to, to use logic in order to construct arguments, you have to make sure that the agents, whether human or artificial, are actually capable of constructing all these arguments that we are required to construct. Okay? And then I will, I will not tell you what my approach is. And then I will briefly overview some reason for that analysis and the what we call dialectical frameworks. And now this idea of that bound of reasoning uh, uh, can meet argumentation. Okay? So that's it. I mean, in logic starts, as, as you all know, with Aristotle, and then, of course, the first, uh, the first important treatise in which uh, the notion of deductive reasoning was uh, typically and extensively employed in order to, to do something serious was, was uh, uh, Euclid's elements. And uh, there was uh, a notion there which explains that there was an idea of science, of knowledge, uh, at the time of Euclid. In general, uh, you know, for, the, for the ancient Greek philosophers and scientists, of course, there was no difference then. Now, we made the difference, which explains a, a, a lot about why logic, uh, mathematical logic, uh, logic has been identified for centuries in mathematical logic, something that you use to prove something uh, in a definitive and infallible way, right? And uh, what happens in the Euclidean model, uh, this is the way in which uh, the philosopher of science, Ingrid Lagerton, she describes it. We start from some postulates, uh, axioms of which common notions and definitions, and these things uh, do not need any proof. Why do they not need any they proof? They, proof? they are self evident. Nobody who is, uh, who is not insane can actually deny any of these axioms or notions. Okay? And uh, then the fact of reason was a brilliant invention <laughs> that, uh, that allowed scientists, mathematicians in particular, uh, to transmit the truth infallibly from the premises to the conclusion. And this, of course, creates this model in which you start from something which is obviously true, and by a deductive reason you obtain something which must be absolutely and infallibly true. Of course, this model has survived for a long time, I would say until the beginning of the 20th century, with uh, axiomatic uh, theories in mathematics. Then, of course, Gale theorems and uh, paradoxes in set theory and all sorts of troubles that happened in the foundations of mathematics between the end of the 19th and the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century actually shook this, this notion, even in mathematics. But it became soon obvious that this way of representing the logic of the activism could not work in everyday practice, uh, even uh, for scientific, non-mathematical, non-purely mathematical theories. Okay? And uh, well, I, mean, I will skip the example, although I'm not really skipping. This is uh, actually a very interesting example of the way in which you proves Proposition 32 to the sum of the triangles of the triangle is equal to 180 degrees. It's interesting. Okay, you start with the picture of the triangle, then, in fact, you could use a lemma, which, is, which means a theorem that has already proved. And uh, the, the, the lemma says basically what we uh, now say, say that if you do parallels, uh, uh, um, uh, two straight lines are parallel, then a straight line a straight line at this time makes the ultimate angle speak up. Okay, so this angle is equal to this, and this angle is equal to this. Okay, so this was proved previously. Now, how this uh, 
intermediate, intermediate conclusion of the to study in an argument, that right? is the intermediate conclusion, would lead to the theorem. Well, it's quite, well, I mean, it's ingenious, and it looks simple once you have done it, okay? So what you do, you, you just extend the base of the triangle, and make it into a straight line, you extend also the sides, making them into straight lines that meet the two parallels, the other parallel being the straight line that uh, was uh, through the vertex of the triangle. Okay? So now, from the previous intermediate result, you know that this angle must be equal to this. Okay? The, uh, sorry, this angle must be equal to this. This angle must be equal to this because they alternate. Okay? This angle is of course equal to itself. So, the sum of this, this and this, must be equal to the sum of this, this and this. And this proves that the sum of the internal angles of the triangle must be under 80 degrees, which is a flat angle. And, and this was the way in which, I mean, one, one might even think, uh, and this is why, why uh, I'm interested in argumentation theory, because, uh, for instance, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the uh, Lacanus approach to uh, philosophical mathematics, Proofs of Reputation. Proofs, proofs of Reputation by Imre Lakatos is a fantastic book in which what he does is actually a presentation theory in mathematics to show what happens in real, informal mathematics because the theory becomes uh, stable and uh, fixed in an axiomatic theory. So how mathematics becomes uh, something stable, for right? Maybe, I don't know, that's an analogy with, uh, with the notion of so either mathematics is not immune from argumentation, especially if you don't think of formal mathematics. Formal mathematics is basically an obsession, an obs an obsession of logicians. Real mathematicians <laughs> prove things informally, we all know that. And, and of course there is no, you know, working in axiomatic theory is not, not what happens usually. Anyway, let's go ahead. What's the problem with the Euclidean model? The obvious one, I mean, the ratio of the of real agents even in science, even in mathematics, it's very simple the result of the deductive process, which starts from universally accepted truth, which cannot be, uh, which, which, to which we cannot object, right? In fact, it's quite the opposite, right? Uh, like in, in assum assumption based reasoning, in fact, we may, may have reasons for uh, uh, undermining some of the assumptions, and, and so put uh, uh, in question the result of that, some, some proven theory. Okay? Even in mathematics, let alone in other areas of science and of practical everyday reason. So typically, uh, this is the result of a dialectic, or I should say, process, in which an argument A, as I uh, just explained very well, in support of, certain th of a certain thesis, can be attacked by a counter argument B that attempts to undermine some of the premises on which A is based. However, as I just explained, A can be defended from such attacks by means of other arguments that have to be on one of its premises, and so on. Under certain conditions, certain sets of arguments may emerge at the given stage of the implementation project as provisionally successful and their conclusions initially justified. Did I put it uh, simply enough? Yes, and uh, I, thought, I would like to note that uh, it arose only visibly the attacks against friends. Yes, nothing else concluded. Yes, yes, yes. I was following you. <laughs> no, no, I know that this is the trend. I didn't want to, to be eccentric, right? <laughs> okay. But uh, I would like to stress provisionally, because what, uh, in fact, I think uh, uh, we should work on a lot is uh, to show how argumentation is actually a process that happens in time. As uh, Imre Lakatos used to say, there is no instant rationality. Rationality can display itself only in time. So, in fact, uh, it might well be that our bases uh, get bigger or smaller, you know, they change over time. And to, uh, not tomorrow, on Friday, for those of you who will be around, I will say something uh, which is related to the, um, to the literature in the philosophy of science um, about uh, this problem. Okay? So, but provisionally, for me here, it's, it's, it's an important work. Okay, a trivial example, maybe it's too trivial, so we will give uh, we have this, uh, what we call the base, so Italian is like football, Mario is Italian, correctly, Francesca is from Rome, Antonio is Italian, Antonio doesn't like football, okay? 
on the map, uh, I have a lot of the space here, you know, but basically the street room effects is Italian and it's like football. Okay. Uh, um, then I put forward the following argument that, uh, uh, sorry, I, 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 put it, I, I wrote it wrong, in fact, the, the street room should have been if all Italians are like football, and next is Italian and next like football, of course. I put forward the argument to my best Italian, therefore my life is good. Maybe I don't know about uh, these two other uh, statements, okay? I don't know that I'm talking about Italian too, and for the last one, like football. Uh, or maybe I do, okay? So basically, of course, here the conclusion. Uh, cannot be justified given uh, this base because of course I can I can always produce the counter argument to one of the premises given the half of so Italians like football and I have to produce <coughs> Italian and one that does not like football which are present in the base the conclusion would uh, negate one of the premises of uh, of uh, uh, one of the uh, premises of this uh, um, of the argument okay so. This argument undermines my original one by attacking the premise, which I forgot to write before, on Italian style football. But after a little thought, I can say, okay, I really, really mean that all Italian style football. I'm trying to explain uh, why, in fact, most the reasoning is not uh, done by a street rules, but I call it in this book. What I really meant was not that all Italian style football, in fact, I meant most Italian style so I introduced a defeasible rule that affects this Italian, then probably or normally, okay, X minus multiple, which is quite different from the strict rule because even if the premise turns out to be true, there's no guarantee that the conclusion must be true. Okay? There might be exceptions. Okay? So, so now I propose a new defeasible argument to break state and previous conclusion. Okay, listen, so I, I took it too seriously. Saying all Italians like football, what I really meant is that most Italians, normally Italians like football. So my real argument is Mario is Italian, therefore, difficile, this difficile entails that Mario likes football. Okay? Next, we learn that Mario was forced by his to play football when he was a kid. How does this change the picture? And uh, perhaps uh, we might all agree on the following difficile rule if Texas is forced to do Y as a kid. Then the hex hates when one. I don't know, it's a difficult rule, but we might agree on that, right? What happens then, of course, it turns out, uh, of course, this uh, explains that, uh, that, uh, that uh, the reason why uh, Mario doesn't like it, doesn't, doesn't like it. Okay? So, in fact, uh, it is uh, given an explanation of what we observe. Mario doesn't like it. But then it turns out that Mario's best friend says that Mario actually loves football. So I, how can I restate my previous conclusion that Mario loves football? Maybe I can, I can introduce a new rule, a physical rule. If Mario's best friend says something about Mario, this must be true about Mario. In that case, of course, the previous physical rule is rebutted, right? It's rebutted the right rule? Okay. So what I want to stress though, apart from the Chiyanti example, and this story might go forever, uh, what uh, um, I think it's important that we don't look at the mutation theory as something static, but something that uh, must be a structure, not only uh, you know, in space, so to speak, when you have an implementation factor, but over time, taking into account the changes that happen in the base, and also the changes, the changes, I will say more about this, Right. Changes that happen in the arguments. I might not want to continue defending the arguments. Right? So even, even if, uh, so to speak, my research program, my general theory remains the same. This is an important, an important distinction that I cannot do now. But uh, you know, uh, uh, within each given theory, when we speak about Newtonian physics, I mean, we should think of Newtonian physics as something which was given once and for all. It developed, and over time, some of the arguments were actually discarded by Newtonians, but it still, it still was Newtonian physics. So, so what, what was even made into Newtonian physics, right? This is the, 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 the crucial point about which I will tell you. I try to attract you to come and see my natural practice. Of course, it's not, 
Okay, so there's no natural ending point unless we take the time to travel. Okay. I will not say uh, much about uh, about uh, um, outside the limitation frameworks doing style because this is quite covered much more professional than I can do by Francesca, so I will not even to go through also because I'm as usual too much material. This is the first time I did, I did this kind of talk and I to talk and so I have no idea how much time I should spend on that. And I don't want to do something different. I want to say something different. I want to tell you that uh, uh, when Francesca said earlier that natural variations in art are only in abstract representations, basically for the art theory. Right? But in structural representation, you know, certain care should be taken on how we actually express the arguments. And this is the reason why I I uh, I've always thought that Francesca is more or less on the same line because she wrote a paper published in Studiologica in which the main Argumentation tool, a tool to construct arguments of the natural deduction, which is a more or less a, a modular, a minor variations, exactly the system that I explained to you, which was introduced essentially by Gaines in, uh, in, in 1935. By this form, it was introduced by uh, was actually this modifying form for due, uh, due to uh, uh, Kravitz, that Kravitz in his famous book, uh, The Study of Natural Deduction. How does it work? Natural deduction works uh, like this. For every logical operator, this junction, conjunction, conditional, negation, you have the introduction rules that tell you what are the conditions under which you can assert a sentence containing that logical operator as the main sentence. And you have also the relation rule about which I will speak in the next slide. Okay, for instance, if I can assert A, here uh, we are very far removed from classical logic. Because when Hansen uh, wrote this paper, in fact, classical semantics uh, was quite suspicious because people wanted to, to um, uh, restrict them themselves to purely combinatorial means without involving all the complexity of set theory, which was kind of uh, suspicious from the metaphysical point of view. Okay? So, proof theory, that is pure proof theory, there is no semantics. Unless we take it into uh, what they call uh, proof theoretical semantics, which means I will tell you uh, what a proof of B or B consists of. I have the proof of B or B if I have the proof of A, or if I have the proof of B, okay? which is similar but not quite the same as the classical condition on the proof of the conjunction. I have the proof of the conjunction if I have the proof of B and the proof of B. Okay? These are the, the most peculiar rules of natural deduction, which are the rules that involve discharge of assumptions. Okay? What is discharge of assumptions? What does this rule say, essentially? And this was actually the reason why Hansen thought that with natural deduction, it was actually giving a tool, a formal tool, which was very close to the way in which people actually reason when they want to show something. Suppose you want to show that if A, then B. Okay? What do you do normally? You assume A, provisionally, okay, that if from A, by a pure applying the rules, you can get to B, then you say that, okay, that if A, then B, but this conclusion does not depend on this assumption anymore. They say that the, the assumption has been discharged because the conclusion does not depend on it. The conclusion depends only on the other assumptions that are not, that are not being discharged by the application of this rule. It's basically what you do when you do a theorem in mathematics. You have a, a, a condition, a, a, an antecedent, a consequent. You assume the antecedent. If you obtain the consequent, you say, okay, I prove that if the antecedent is true, then the consequent is true. Or, or, or prove a law or whatever you do. Okay? And this is a peculiar sign in a natural deduction, which basically means inconsistency. I mean, if I obtain a contradiction, then this is a symbol that stands for the fact that it's a mark. Or at least this is the way I like to, to look at it. It's a map that says essentially that the contradiction has been reached. Okay? Then he says, okay, what does it mean to prove your negation of A? It means that if I assume A and I find the contradiction, then I can say that A is false. Okay? This is not quite the same thing as what happens in classical. Absolutely, because in classical logic you have a notion of truth and falsity. 
that are quite independent for to, for, from what you are able to do or not. I mean, a, a sentence is either true or false, quite independently of, of whether you are able to prove it or not, or to prove its negation. You might be unable to prove it or, or to prove its negation, but you always know in classical logic it's, it's either true or false. Okay, then. In fact, the negation of natural deduction can be defined this way. A implies uh, a contradiction. Okay? And uh, these are the introduction rules of natural deduction. The, 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 the elimination rules, some of them are very familiar. This is known as Paulus, the Solus Principles, third century before Christ. This is uh, a trivial rule. Uh, my students, they have uh, difficulty uh, when I explain this rule because they say, well, it's obvious. And I say, well, it's much better. Logic must be obvious. As I used to say, okay, if I have a proof of A and B, this means that I have a proof of A. And the same with the other people. This is modus ponens, and this is a rule saying that, you know, a contradiction that is uh, it's absurd. So this symbol is often that is absurd. So these two, rule, two sets of rules, introduction and elimination, taken together, allow us to construct arguments that look like, uh, like uh, they may be structured in a variety of ways, depending on the notation, but the original notation used by Gens and Planets was tree, a tree in which the original assumptions were the leaves of the tree, and the final conclusion was a root of the tree. Right? And that some of the assumptions uh, may be discharged in the process, and uh, maybe all of them can be discharged, okay? And some of them might be, might be left there. And so the conclusion depends only on the undischarged assumption, okay? Assumptions. Okay, for instance, just to give you an example, and give you some practice. Suppose we want to prove the trivial uh, inference that A, if I, if I know A or B, and I know that A implies C, and I know that B implies C, what can I conclude from these three premises? But independent, I mean, even intuitively, independent of natural production. Okay, we will see. Yeah, see, of course, yes. But what's the kind of reason you are doing, uh, you, are, you are performing in your, in your mind, so to speak, when you say, okay, C must be true? This is a question which is asked for uh, What's the kind of reason? Intuitively, I mean, definitely. I had one of these and both of them Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's quite trivial. I mean, if I, if I know that either one or the two must be true, and uh, if A is true, C is true, and B is true, then C is true, then of course I can prove C. Okay? And does C, at the end of this, uh, uh, with this premises, does C depend on A or on B? What does C depend on, in your opinion? It depends only on these premises, right? I, I don't need to assume anything else to, to, to entail C. So how do I do this piece of reasoning that you have in the screen using the rules of natural deduction? Okay, look at this rule. Of course, what, what's the meaning of this? The meaning of this, before you, you make an attempt to, to use these rules, is the following. If you uh, have A among the assumptions, this does not mean that A is the only assumption. Not be, there might well be other assumptions as well as that. Okay? So if from A we possibly with other assumptions, you can deduce C. And from B possibly with other assumptions, you can deduce C, then you can conclude C discharging both A and B. So how would you proceed here? You start with A or B, okay? So how would you apply the elimination rule, this elimination rule given given the premises? For, for each premise, look at the, uh, the definition of this item, okay? If I have A plus B, C, okay, I can, of course, obtain C using most components. But what do I need in order to obtain C using most components? In order to obtain C from A in plus C, using this rule, okay, what do I need? <coughs> So if I have A and A implies C, then I can obtain C. And this is basically an application of this one, of the normal response. Okay? Alright. Okay. So what, what, should, what I have to do with the other 
Right. The same thing. Okay? But this time I don't assume A anymore, but I assume B. Okay? So B implies C, B, C. Now, okay, am, I, am I in a position to apply this rule? I mean, here I have C, which is obtained from A with another assumption. I have C, which has been obtained from B with another assumption. So this condition is satisfied. This condition is satisfied. Here I have A and B. So can I apply the rule? Yes. So I conclude C. But what do I have to do now? Before the application of the rule is completed. The conclusion does not depend on A and B anymore when you apply this rule, right? I have to discharge that, okay? So I put that into the square brackets and I say, okay, I know using this rule that this conclusion does not depend on A. So the, conclu the conclusion now depends on which uh, assumptions, the undischarged ones, that is A or B, A by C, B by C. So I have proven this case, okay? I mean, although it may look uh, a bit odd for people who are used to it, but this is exactly the piece of reasoning that you were, that you were performing when you gave me your intuitive uh, explanation, more or less. Right? Well, I would say exactly the same. You say, if A is true, then I know that A implies C is true, then I can do C. If B is true, and I know that B implies true, then I can do C. Since one of the two must be true, then C can be derived, doesn't matter whether A or B, so it doesn't depend on A being true, on A is being true, or on B is being true, okay? That's why I discharge A and B, okay? In either case, it works. And so I don't, I'm not committing to the fact that A is true, I'm not committing to the fact that B is true, okay? Because in either case, I commit to the fact that this one or two must be true, of course, all right? Is this clear enough? Then, then, what you have seen so far gives you, uh, doesn't give you uh, classical logic. It gives you a subsystem of classical logic, which is called the intuitionistic logic. For those of you who want to, you know, to pursue this part of this right relationship on, on, the, on the, the relationship uh, between the natural production and intuitionistic logic, and the way in which it refers to classical logic. And the reason is that the one I told you before, in fact, what Jensen did, he, he took the intuitive explanation of the logical operator, which was given by the intuitionists, who were a famous student in philosophy and mathematics, who claimed actually the principle of bivalence as a whole, because we don't know. I mean, we have to know actually, uh, we don't know whether there's such a thing as a mathematical world outside us that makes sentences either true or false, right? I mean, a sentence is true when you prove it. And the sentence is false when you prove its negation. I mean, uh, unless you are a platonist, as they say, and you think that there are mathematical entities out there, like there are uh, buildings and stones, assuming that there are buildings and stones, because the same kind of uh, you know, skepticism could be applied also to, to the so called uh, digital world. Right? So, intuitionism doesn't accept this principle of bivalence, and therefore, you would never accept such a rule, which is called classical reduction absolutely. You say, okay, if I have a, from A, I can derive a contradiction, then A must be false. But if, if not from not A, I derive a contradiction, I don't have a from A. And there are a lot of, uh, of uh, examples <coughs> that I cannot go through them now, in which you actually see that uh, when you prove, uh, this is uh, called uh, proof ex absurdo, when you prove a mathematical statement ex absurdo, in fact, what you come up is not a constructive proof of the conclusion. It's just uh, an argument which is partly metaphysical to, to assert that the conclusion must be true. Or uh, A or not A uh, as an accident. So either you add to the previous rule this classical reduction pseudonym or you add the text with the conduct of okay? This one is another rule that is needed also in the intuitionistic version, okay? which is very controversial, not only for classical logic, but also for intuitionistic logic. 
says basically if we reach a contradiction, then everything is implied by contradiction. Okay? And uh, well, I, I, you instigate a proof of this, an interior proof, which is quite tricky because it's quite tricky to, to argue against this proof, right? So you say, okay, if you have a P, then of course if P is true, then P or Q is true, right? But then if not P is true, this, uh, for these two premises, for a rule that dates back to the sequence again, third century before Christ, which is called this giant syllogism, I can derive Q. But there is no relation. There might be even no syntactic relation between P and Q. Right. So this is a problem, and this is very difficult to, 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 to undermine this argument. But here, here, look, I mean, it's very simple what you have done. We have used the introduction of this judgment. I mean, what's uh, more basic? Then the introduction of this natural is P is true, I mean, P is true, and P is true. Then uh, we use this gentle syllogism, the sequence claim that even his dog was aware of this rule because uh, he had a hunting dog, and when he was actually sniffing um, the roll, and he, he came by, by location, and he didn't smell, uh, uh, he didn't feel the, 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 the smell of, the, of the, the rabbit on one. Branch, so it straight goes to the other branch without smelling again. So he said either the rabbit went that way or he went that way. He didn't go that way, then he went that way. Okay? So I mean, here, and also what else do you have? You have transitivity. So I either you give up this transitional introduction, or you give up transitivity, or you give up this transitivity. In all cases, you are in different trouble. So this is quite a, a, a big job. So let's go. So let's go back to the argumentation theory, though. And uh, I wanted to show you something here. Uh, first. <coughs> and other examples of natural production process, so at least you, you, you come out of here, you get out of here with something more. Um... Okay. For instance, this is a quite uh, simple proof of this the normal law, but I'm not asking you to follow it in detail, but it's quite simple actually. I mean, it's exactly what you, you would do naturally to, to uh, show that this is uh, true. And this is classical. It's an intelligence which is classical. This is the other side of, of the other the the rule, which is not. Uh, sorry, I meant this is intuitionistic. As well as classical, of course, because intuition is logic. It's a subsystem of classical logic. Every law of intuition is logic. It's also a law of classical and non classical. Okay, so here, this is uh, intuitionistically, but not classically valid. Look at, I mean, this proof, if you have time to try and do it yourself, you would, I mean, you would, it's very difficult to come up with this proof. I mean, I, I myself have trouble with that. Really, I mean, I've been using natural deduction for 30 years. It was a problem, and the problem is that uh, the rules of natural deduction are not suited to intuitionistic logic, not to classical logic. So when you have a, 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 a law, a logical law, which is uh, classically valid, but not <coughs> intuitionistic valid, you, 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 can, you, you are in trouble. And it's very difficult to find it. Okay, it's just, uh, I don't have enough time to go through the details. Because I want to... Uh, to show you something else. Okay, nationality constraints. The problem that prompted for, um, people to put forward nationality constraints was that, uh, as Francesca might tell you much better than me, uh, is. Uh, there were a lot of systems coming, uh, coming up in the implementation field in the old days, and you know, they would be useful to solve all sorts of problems, but then they had vague and counterintuitive consequences, right? And uh, this uh, prompted, uh, in the first place, Kamilanda and Nangu to propose uh, this rationality process, like some kind of rationality constraints, like, uh, like in probability theory, that, that uh, an argumentation system must satisfy. Okay? And uh, one of these constraints was called, 
I will just skip through them a little bit, get into the disclosure and the sub arguments. Basically, it says that whenever you have a sub atom, this is not uh, the way in which we express them, but it's probably very similar. When you have a sub argument, it depends on how you define a sub argument. When you have a sub argument, uh, 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 and, and, and your extension, which is what um, Francesca has, uh, was talking about before, your extension include an argument, you must also include all, all this argument if the extension is complete. Okay? And the closure are the strict rules. So if, uh, if uh, uh, you have uh, uh, some arguments in your extension, and then uh, uh, the conclusions of the arguments are the premises of the strict rule that imply a certain conclusion, then the, uh, there must be a way of having an argument uh, in your extension that concludes to that conclusion. That uh, gives you that conclusion. Okay, so the, the conclusion of the, the conclusions, uh, the argument, the argument based on the conclusions is like uh, it's like using methods. Okay, I first prove uh, all the premises of the strict rule, each by each, each by um, uh, one at a time, and then uh, I apply the strict rule to say, okay, given all the original assumptions, I can prove So it's closure on the strict rule. And consistency, which is usually, is usually, um, I mean, which is a thing which sounds obvious, but it's not really so obvious to me. And uh, uh, especially in one of these versions, because there are two versions of consistency. There is the, the, the simple version is direct consistency, okay, and uh, Uh, okay, and I forgot to say what direct consistency is, I will tell you by voice, I didn't write it on the slide. Direct consistency means that the new extension cannot be two arguments that can lead to, to uh, complementary conclusions, right? Okay, so this is direct consistency. And, uh, and also, there are closure on the strict rules that's not complex. Okay, and this is called indirect consistency. This is, of course, much more problematic. This is the consequence of so if you take, uh, if you, you add that, uh, that uh, uh, for all A and B that belong to the conclusions that are uh, of, of, of the arguments in the extension, uh, A must be different from the negation of the conjure, whatever you want to call it, of B. And moreover, this must happen also when you close everything under switch rules, the consequences of your consequences. Okay, which is not, it's not so trivial actually. I always say that this, in reality, this never kind of happens. Excuse me, it cannot happen because uh, uh, proving that something is indirectly consistent is literally uh, trivial. Okay, then we have, uh, I mean, I will just quickly overview this uh, much more in the postcard, but it's essentially, but by giving you just the idea of the non these two postulates are called uh, non interference and crash persistence, but together as a whole of non-contamination process. What they basically say that the status, uh, the status of, uh, of uh, an argument, okay, if I have an argument in my extension, and uh, for instance, uh, this argument is good, okay, this cannot be affected by other sentences in the base which are not syntactically related to the, to the premises of the argument, okay? And uh, so the point is that I, if I have a good a language which is good in an extension, in a, sorry, in a base, I cannot really make it bad by joining this base with another base which contains other uh, sentences which are uh, unrelated syntactically to the ones in the previous base. There must be at least one single recommon in order to affect the status of the, the justification status of the language. Okay? You can't really have, okay, my argument uh, starting from base B and Q is justified, and then if I add to the base uh, a syntactical disjoint formula, say R, then it becomes unjustified. This is intuitively wrong, okay, because there is no relation. If there is no syntactical relation, then there is no way in which they can actually interfere. This is the basic idea, okay? Now let's go quickly. The other aspect I want to talk, to talk to you today, which has to do with uh, back bound reasoning and uh, resource bound uh, One problem uh, of logic, uh, which I already said something, that conditions have 
focus on even normative characterization of concept relation that comply with some notion of deductive inference, as the one I showed during the beginning, because it is emphatic the truth of the premise of the conclusion. But their models are not scalable. They reflect the logical competence of ideal agents with other resources. And there is no way in a natural deduction standard, natural deduction of saying, okay, this is the thing. Unless you put an arbitrary bound on the length of the proof bar, as I will try to explain, uh, the length of the proof is not the good ground for, for, for describing the, the, the difficulty of finding the proof. Okay? And uh, they're not scalable, and that they, so they can reflect on the logical competence of ideal agents okay? with unlimited resources. This is known in the literature, also in the scaling logic as a problem of logical uses. And we have uh, even at the level of proposition of logic, uh, well, in general, where the logic is uh, what I call the essential tension, which is the logic, uh, they say it's informationally trivial in the sense that uh, the conclusion of the, of the, of the argument, of the, of the deduction, of the deductive reasoning is already, uh, the information conveyed by the conclusion is already contained in some sense in the information conveyed by the premises. And this is why people like Francis Bacon and so on, what we're probably going to do with this topic. It's, I'm as doing inductive logic because the deductive logic is useless. I mean, it doesn't give, give us any new information. It's not something that we already knew in the beginning when we knew about the premises, which of course is not true in practice because nobody can have that, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the theorem that I just showed you to, to talk about, uh, about a very simple example, the one uh, concerning the, the, the internal triangle, uh, angles of the triangle, was already immediately, obviously. The information that the theorem is true is contained in the in Euclid's postulates. In no way. You look at Euclid's postulates before going to that theorem, you have to do quite a lot of work. But this is another talk. So it's supposed to be information trivial. However, we know, well, we know. In one case, we know, in the other case, we strongly suspect that it is computationally hard. Most interesting objects are other than the cycle, or very likely. Like classical propositional logic, the intuitionistic propositional logic is even probably worse than classical logic, uh, intractable. And I'm not going to explain to you what intractable is, okay? Uh, but um, you see, in classical logic, with quantifiers, uh, as, as, as it's well known, since the 30s or the 20th century, is, uh, is uh, undecidable. There's no algorithm to answer the questions, all the questions is a logical consequence of gamma. It's a set of premises, but there is even classical proposition of the, the thing that people in, uh, until 20 years ago, not uh, when computer science, uh, 30 years ago, when computer science was still uh, in its beginning, they would skip the proposition of logic as it was uninteresting. Now, by the theory of empty completeness, you know that in fact is much more interesting than the first of the logic, because in fact the connection that the proposition of logic has with a lot of hard computational problems, it's quite amazing. And this is the result of the theorem shown by, by Hook uh, in the early 70s, Pacific Hook. For instance, um, it's a basic combinatorial factor that we don't fit uh, n plus 1 regions in n holes, right? If you require that the control should not contain more than one region, uh, we think it's obvious, okay? So this is quite an artificial example. This is quite a natural example, which can be expressed uh, in Boolean logic, because many things that uh, look uh, like first order can be actually expressed in Boolean logic, provided you put a bound on the domain. Here, if you have actually uh, three pigeons with two um, holes, once we, we have uh, the domain is finite, okay, and with a finite number of pigeons and the finite number of holes, I can express everything in propositional logic. I don't need quantify, so what I used to, of course. Uh, uh, but uh, so this. Says essentially, it's conjunction of these junctions, say essentially that uh, uh, three pigeons can fit in one hole and uh, ni neither pair of them can be in the same hole. Okay? No, oh, sorry, no pair of them can be in the same hole. Okay? So this is what it's saying. So pigeon one is either in hole one or in hole two, pigeon two is either in hole one or in hole two, pigeon three is either in hole one or in hole two, and so on. Okay, so on. That's it, because that remote. And they say, okay, it's not the case that pigeon, up, pigeon one and pigeon two are both in whole one. It is not the case that pigeon one and pigeon three are both in whole one, and so on and so forth. 
So this is a, a very simple uh, way of expressing the opinion of the principle, which is a basic and important combinatorial fact in the world, from which a lot of things fall actually. Uh, I mean, in fact, we're not entirely wrong, it follows from this principle. In fact, uh, in New York City, there are at least two people with exactly the same number of hairs in their, in their, in their head. Yes, it follows from this principle. This, this sentence is, uh, well, the principle, of course, is, is the negation of this, because this sentence is uh, inconsistent. So, the principle is a tautology, because it negates a contradictory sentence, okay? The, the negation of a contradictory sentence is a tautology. So, this sentence is not really inconsistent, uh, and so its negation is a tautology. Uh, it's very hard to recognize this tautology, it's very, very hard to recognize this Consistent. Of course, when it, it is hard, when the number of pigeons of the mole grows, okay? So if you have a very large number of pigeons and a very large number of holes, okay, in the same kind of configuration, it's, uh, um, it was first proven in 1987 by Adam that the most efficient uh, uh, theorem proving system for propositional logic known, known until then until then, sorry, which is resolution, is actually intractable for this problem, which means it requires proofs which are of exponential length, with uh, uh, proof whose minimum length is exponential in the size of the proposition that you, of which you want to prove the inconsistency. And this was proven by Eichmann. And of course, uh, there is pattern, which is very popular in you know, satisfiability, and you're proving it is computationally but, uh, as far as the length of proof is concerned, it's worse in resolution. It's more efficient in terms of uh, proof procedures, proof algorithms. But in terms of length of proofs, you can have shorter proofs in resolution than you have in that pattern. I'm saying this for those who are familiar with the theory proof. But it's not so important. The important thing is that uh, we all know that, you know, logic is. Uh, uh, there are a lot of examples. People are doing also statistical analysis to see of, of, of what, what, what the seat in the structure of the, of the tautology that causes this combinatorial explosion. So, for instance, the ratio between the number of uh, atomic sentences and the complexity of the formula. For instance, we have very large formulas with very few atomic sentences. Then it, it can be shown that these are quite easy to prove if you don't do, if you don't get things very wrong. But if you have also a large number of atomic sentences with the comparatively um, only a bit longer formula. Uh, sorry, it's, it's a formula which is long, okay, but uh, whose number of atomic sentences are almost the same size, uh, the same number as the size of the formula. That is quite easy in that case, it's quite probable to manage to prove that it is actually uh, not inconsistent, okay? So if there are few atomic sentences and the formula is very long, it's easy to show that it's inconsistent. It is inconsistent. If there are if the number of atomic sentences is only a bit uh, smaller than the size of the formula, then it is easy to, usually, statistically, it is easy to show that it is consistent. The trouble is with this kind of formula, in which the number of atomic formula and the size of the formula are kind of, in, you know, they're not so obviously related. I mean, I think we have the number of atomic formulas is actually uh, related. Uh, I mean, it, it's not really. Uh, we have uh, I don't want to call it because I'm Okay, so, I mean, yes, please. What if you formalize the different logic? Like, uh, linear logic? Uh, uh, well, linear logic, uh, I mean, you should. Uh, uh, linear logic, uh, uh, I, you know, when I was, uh, I suppose, your age, I'm old. Uh, when, when I was about your age, it was the time of linear logic. No. <laughs> was, uh, I, I brought some things to talk about linear logic. The problem is it, it immediately came out that linear logic is hopeless from, the, from, from this point of view. Because even the whole closed fragment of linear logic is intractable, which is, as you know, classical logic is intractable at the propositional level. So linear logic is, is usually linear logic, relevance logic, all these logics that have conditions quite strict on the and you have to count how many times you are using the assumptions, they're computationally much worse than the classical or intuition psychology. But this is by Alice that Perker in this respect. It's a study very interesting. Anyway, so I'm not going to say that it's not only psychological, I'm not going to bother you with the statement that I 
to this to see what, uh, what happens when you have an exponential time algorithm. And, uh, but the interesting thing, uh, and the main reason is not uh, that it takes, uh, it takes uh, because the, this is taken, this picture is taken from the book by, uh, which is still quite popular, the book by Gary and Johnson, Computers and Interpretability. You've heard of it. Yeah, and uh, this book was written in 1976, and every two years there is a new edition because the list of young people with warranty heart problems is growing. Okay, but this paper also reflects, uh, you know, the computational speed of, uh, you know, the operational speed of a computer at that time, right? Of course, and so uh, it showed actually what happens in the obvious paper with the exponential time. With three, if the algorithm, the execution time of the algorithm is 3 to n, you know, uh, even uh, an example with, uh, on length 60, which is of course ridiculous for a computer, would take uh, this, uh, well, of course, a ritmo time, even 10 million operations uh, per second. Of course, you might say, okay, but this takes was 10 million operations per second. Okay, so this is the main point. Uh, the, most, the more interesting table to it says that what happens uh, when uh, you increase the speed, the, uh, the operational speed of your computer. So if you have a linear hour, of course, uh, uh, this is uh, the time it takes to the computer, to the hour, to solve the problem of length n. Okay? So let's, let's say that the time it takes uh, to, to this hour, this linear time hour, to solve the problem of length n is n big n1. Of course, if you have a computer which is 10 times faster, it will solve an example which is uh, in an hour, okay? Even an hour. I mean, this is the, the maximum length of an example that, uh, that uh, the computer can solve within an hour with present computer, okay? With 10 times faster when it's linear, so it's quadratic, of course, doesn't work so obviously. What happens when uh, you have exponential algorithms, actually, even uh, multiplying by a factor of 1,000, the, the, the speed of the computer makes a negligible difference with respect to the maximum size of the example that can be solved in an hour. Only about less than seven symbols. <laughs> I spend a lot of money to have a computer which is 1,000 times faster, and then I get uh, only uh, an answer to seven symbols. So, so I mean, this is just for kids, okay? So, for you, like that, all more, more expert. So, in fact, uh, let's go back to our original problem. Given this situation, uh, there are degrees of logical competence. You can assume an agent. That doesn't matter whether it's human or artificial. Because even computers have their limitations. Okay? It's as bad like anyone else. It, uh, it, uh, there was an article in Nature, which was published 20 years ago. And they showed that uh, they calculated the time that it would take uh, uh, the ultimate laptop. The ultimate laptop would be the fastest, the fastest laptop of about uh, the size of a uh, current laptop that, uh, that can be constructed according to the laws of nature, right? So when you have uh, an exponential algorithm, even with an input uh, which is um, large, let's say 1,000, 2,000 symbols, the time required um, by the ultimate laptop, so you can do better than that in nature, would be more than the time that's uh, uh, pa uh, passed from the Big Bang until now. So it's uh, an article which is published in nature. So it's a uh, sort of bigger folklore. But of course, I mean, given this situation, even the say of the so we can't really pretend that nothing, uh, you know, everything is the same. Okay? We assume the classical uh, consequence relation, we assume it. No, I mean, we can't assume that people can construct all logical algorithms. This is the main point. I want to come back. Okay, so virtually, I mean, we know, we think, for those of you who have been teaching logic, Francesca, for sure, or have been taking, uh, or have been attending courses in logic, and you know very well that everyone can recognize that P implies Q and P logically entails, so it would be this thing as Q. Okay, but then if you have an inference which involves a complex space reasoning, I mean, I have an experience which takes back to about 30 years ago now. I mean, I, I can tell you exactly where my students are in trouble, and this was the inspiration of this work I've been doing over the last few years in that boundaries. So, can we naturally define a degree of logical depth and associate it with the degree of difficulty of an inference? This is the point. 
Okay? I don't want because I want to say, okay, let's say that I will do uh, all proofs which are up to my end. And why not add plus one then? Well, what is, is this related to the intrinsic difficulty of the proof? Not really. There are proofs which are quite long, but they're not difficult. I mean, it depends, of course, they are exponentially long with respect to the, to the size of the formula you want to prove. If the size is very large, then it becomes difficult. But normally, the length of the proof is not really a measure of difficulty of length. It doesn't measure anything. You can't really put an arbitrary bound on the length of the proof. It doesn't make any sense, in my view. So, is that something more natural that we can call the logical that? Why is this important for implementation theory? Because in implementation theory, we want to simulate the activity of real agents or artificial agents actually construct arguments. So they will have bounds, okay? And so they will be able to uh, construct not all arguments, but only a subset of them, okay? So standard formalizations of logic do not allow for such a classification of inference. After all, they do really more difficult. So, look at these two examples. We'll do something a bit practical again. There is, a, for instance, I can tell you that my students can solve this. I mean, they are shown the sequence is correct. They can see, but then, for some reason, I never understood. They get in trouble with this one. Usually. Okay, let's look at the first one. It is even without using uh, uh, formal rules, intuitively. Because the rules uh, that I'm going to show you will be exactly those that you use when presenting it. Here we are saying, I would say J is aggressive towards B or to Charles. So I'm saying J is not aggressive towards B, but can I conclude from these two sentences? From the first and the last. That J is aggressive towards Charles. Here I say, well, if J is aggressive towards Charles, which I just uh, concluded, then Charles is aggressive towards J. Then I can conclude. The child is addressed to a J. So I, I, I can easily go to the conclusion. 99% of my students, even untrained in the can solve this example. This one is a bit more difficult. I mean, most people, especially when I do the test, the, the admission test, you know, there are some things they want to be like, oh, is this inference correct or not? 50%, 60%, of the even more, they fail it. It's, it's even shorter. I mean, in fact, I mean, it's, uh, it's not the length of the premises or whatever, it's not the number of premises. The number of premises is actually smaller. What does this say? J is aggressive towards B or towards Charles. Okay? So this is saying what happens if, if J is aggressive towards B. Okay? Then J is aggressive towards Charles. Okay? So we know that in the case in which J is aggressive towards B, then the conclusion falls. What else can we say? What is the other case? One case is that J is aggressive towards B. What's the other case? Obvious case. Either J is aggressive towards B or. J is aggressive towards B. No, 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 this is what they say before. Yes, okay. That's fine. Uh, of course. Uh, this, is, this is one way of looking at it. Okay. Perfect answer. Perfect answer. Okay, so the other case is that J is aggressive towards Charles. So in either case, the conclusion works. But um, I will have to change this example. You, you remind me, I got to say, because it doesn't show what I wanted to show. Uh, what I, 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 I will tell you now, without showing it in this example, that in fact this is not the right, the right way of doing case reasoning. I mean, there are complex results. The right way of doing case reasoning is always like a, either J is aggressive towards B or J is not aggressive towards B, okay? which is true independent of any premise. Now, in any information state, either, well, not in the information state, in classical logic, either J is aggressive towards B or J is not aggressive towards B, in any, in any possible world. Okay? And so the, the case reason we have to do uh, can be done like the field, which would be an application by the way of the natural data rule that we saw before, this one. But there are more complex cases in which you can show, in fact, branching and in, 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 in using. Uh, um, co uh, complementary and uh, incompatible cases is much more efficient. In this case, the result would be the same because if J is not aggressive towards B, of course, uh, by the first uh, premise, it will be aggressive towards Charles by the jumping of course, right? And so you get exactly the same conclusion. If 
if you, if you branch, but in general it's much more efficient to branch. This is the way I formalized because I wanted to. Uh, so this is the first, the first, the first uh, inference. So what's happening? What's the difference between uh, okay, the? The second, the second uh, inference is this one. I say okay. Suppose A is a case to B, then by uh, uh, two. A is adjusted to C, okay? Then I might do exactly what you said if you were using standard natural deduction, okay? So, okay. Now, suppose that A is adjusted to C, then it trivially follows that A is adjusted to C. So, in both cases, uh, the conclusion follows. But even if I split like this, I say, suppose A is adjusted to C, then A is adjusted to C. And then I say, okay, suppose now the contrary, that A is not adjusted to something you can always say independent of many terms. Okay? Then by this gentle syllogism, you know, since I know that A is aggressive either towards B or C, and I know that uh, uh, J, um, that A is not aggressive towards B, then it must be aggressive uh, or she must be aggressive towards C. And I make the same conclusion. Without getting into the details now, I showed a long time ago that this way of splitting is exponentially more efficient than the other way. And when it comes to the new case, for example, that goes back to my PhD thesis. But the result in this case is exactly the same. So, what's the difference then? Here, we are playing only with information that we actually possess. We are not making suppositions, which are not the suppositions. <laughs> we are not making hypotheses, so to speak, right? We are not saying, let's suppose, never. Okay? I have information, I don't have to imagine. What happens if and what happens if not? Okay? I don't have to do that. Here, I need to do more work, intellectual work, because I have to say, even computing, I'm not a computer scientist. But I suppose, not only computationally, because it's a branch, a branch basically. This is branch. Okay. Case reasoning is branch. Okay? So there are more efficient and less efficient ways of branching. The more, the more efficient is the one I told you before, but I can't show now why. It's in, what, in a paper on my which dates back to my I'm And here, so what's the difference? Here, we're not reasoning only with the information we actually have. We have to put, in our, uh, to simulate, in our information states, information like that A is aggressive towards B, or A is not aggressive towards B, that is not the okay? information state. I have to go out of the data. I have to go out of my information state. Okay? This is what happens in the discharge rules of, uh, of uh, standard natural deduction. Okay? Exactly this is what happens. Here you have to make a hypothesis. This is a sentence here is not part of something that you know is true. This is something that you you don't know whether these two are true. You know that at least one of them is true, by you, which is said by this sentence. But you don't know that this is true, you don't know that this is true. You are simulating information that you don't actually have. This is what I call virtual information. Okay? And the same with the rule of uh, conditional interaction. One thing that, uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, intuitively convey the reason why I think that is the use of this thing that I call virtual information that is responsible for the combinatorial exclusion is that, uh, I mean, think of the purely uh, the, the pure implication fragment of intuition logic. Intuition logic okay? There are only two rules. Most commons, okay? A and A implies B and A is B. And this introduction. These two rules together, introduction and elimination, are complete for the pure implication fragment of intuition logic. This trivial pair of rules makes an intractable system. It's intractable, it's proved by Stadman back in the 70s. So, what's the idea? What is it? The problem is exactly this use of virtual information. So, what is the next problem? How can we minimize the use of virtual information given that the one thing I focus that is the, uh, the, the source of, uh, of, uh, of computational analysis? <coughs> Uh, I, a long time ago, I started working on this alternative to standard against natural deduction, which is like standard 
against this kind of natural reflection is more suited to intuitionistic logic. This is more suited to classical logic. You still have introduction rules and elimination rules, but as you see, there is no virtual information. Okay, here you have this rule here is exactly the same as uh, uh, the introduction of conjunction and standard virtual reflection. Yeah, you have, uh, for each rule, you have uh, not only rules for introducing a, a, a sentence but, uh, with a logical operator, but also the negation of the sentence with that logical operator. So there's a synthesis which is typical of classical that helps a lot in finding rules. Okay? So you say, okay, if the phi is false, then the conjunction of phi and sign is the false either. Okay? And uh, these rules are basically the, the lines of the two things in the form of introduction. It's a parsimonious way of expressing the truth tables uh, uh, because the truth tables, of course, A or B, whereas A or B is true if either, well, uh, phi or psi is true if either phi is true or psi is true. I mean, it's a parsimonious way of uh, expressing the truth. This as far as the introduction is concerned, but even the elimination rules, they involve no virtual information, no rules that require this chart of assumptions. And we have uh, they all do with this gentle syllogism. By the way, it's not a natural deduction. To prove this gentle syllogism, usually, you need uh, uh, to use a rule with virtual information. So this, this is a, doesn't require any natural information. And again, for each rule, you have this new one. You see, this is the one of this. And these rules, amazingly enough, were known to the old book I mean, in Sexus and Pyrrhus, we find uh, Pyrrhonian sketches. You find exactly this elimination of rules and principles said that okay, these are the most rules. No, not exactly all of them, but they can be, I mean, these ones can be derived by principles rules, okay? Because they are, and then what happens? This is not, uh, this system of introduction and elimination rule is not a complete system for classical logic. It's not complete, okay? Uh, but uh, it, it has some proofs that do not that. All the proofs are like the first reference I showed you. It only manipulates actual information. You don't have to make, you, don't, you never have to discharge hypothesis. And in fact, turns out that it's of course structural. Even the working hypothesis, uh, I told it's quite it's structural. It's, it's a very simple quadratic algorithm to show um, uh, every inference that can be done with the soul, and uh, I suppose it can be also improved. Uh, well, this is an example, okay, that's it's very simple. But then you can linearize this, you can do it like a natural introduction. But we have, when you have uh, zero depth rules, so you don't need to, to invent like your Fitch style natural introduction for those who are familiar with Fitch style natural introduction. So, I mean, in fact, you don't need to express uh, this argument expressed as a tree, it's exactly the same as this argument expressed as a sequence, but this is much more concise. Because when you have uh, um, two assumptions that are used uh, several times, when you have one assumption which is used several times, okay, here you have, uh, sorry, rewind. When you have a conclusion, like here, A or B, that is used several times, you have to, you, to, to construct this subtree several times whenever you use that conclusion. Right? Whereas here, when you have, once you have a conclusion, you can use it whenever you want, so you just linearize it. Okay? Oh, look at this. So this is an exercise here before we finish. This is a, a real uh, problem that was uh, given an empirical, uh, I mean, they did a test, the Stanovich and Doppler ran an empirical test of this problem. 86% of the participants chose C. Well, okay, I shouldn't have shown you the solution. <laughs> the exercise doesn't make any sense. Can at least some of you tell me why the correct answer is A? So Jack is looking at Anne and then is looking at Joe. Jack is married. Maybe it's not so politically correct in this example, but I mean, it's, uh, it's not mine. <laughs> it's, uh, Jack is looking at Anne and then is looking at Joe. Jack is married and Joe is not married. Is a married person looking at an unmarried one? Possible answers? Yes, no, cannot be determined. 86% of the participants said it cannot be determined. So, what's the piece of reasoning that is missing in 86% of the participants? Whereas, 
although I am now the real experiment, but my, my experience in teaching, I, I'm absolutely sure that if there are no, there is no use of virtual information, I think 6% will get it right. Not wrong, right? But here, of course, there is virtual information. What's the missing piece of information? We know that Jack is married, we know that George is not married. So who is the person about whom we have no information about his, his or her marital status? It's Anne, right? So there are two possibilities. Either I, uh, I think so. Okay. Either Anne is married or Anne is unmarried. Okay? So if Anne is married, she's looking at George, and so a married person is looking at her married. Okay? If Anne is not married, uh, uh, Jack is looking at Anne. But since Jack is married, again, a married person is looking at her married one. So in either case, the conclusion holds. But this is something that people find difficult because it involves this use of virtual information. Anne is married, Anne is not married. You see that here, this way of splitting, of course, I could add here. Trivially, at this junction, say either Anne is married or Anne is not married. Okay? But there is no reason to do it because, of course, it, it's obvious that either Anne is married or Anne is not married. I don't have to assume it was a premise, it's a tautology. When you add the tautology, a very simple one, by the way, in this case, uh, as a premise, there is no reason to add it because it doesn't have, really add anything to the deduction. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, forget uh, about this because we are going to finish and I want to show you something else because what I want to show in this slide is that this is what, uh, what distinguishes I've done a real study, personal, not empirical about this with Sudoku because I don't like doing difficult Sudoku so I like only doing easy Sudoku <laughs> because I can solve them, you know and also I don't want to start making, uh, you know, pencil, rubber and what, what is the reason? If you are careful enough, in easy Sudoku you can do it with an ink because we are only manipulating actual information. That you don't have to make any hypothesis about it. So in an easy Sudoku, it does feel things in a sequence, like we do with our single values. No, no hypothesis. And the underlying logic, of, I, I actually did, did an extensive search on my own. All the easy Sudokus uh, can be described by the zero logic. All, all of them. Then when you go to uh, medium difficulty or that they will <laughs> Of course, this depends on virtual information. For instance, in this case, you say, okay, this is a simple case here. Either 5 is here or 9 is here. Let's see what happens if 5 is here. Okay, and then I continue with the zero values, and I get some information which is in green, which is all consequences of virtual information. In fact, they do not belong to my information set, to my virtual information state. They are subject to the hypothesis that I don't know about. That phi is about the choice. Then I do the same thing with 9, and I come, come, come up with the same conclusion about this cell. And so I just delete all the restart and then put 7 in there. So I go back to, you know, so what's the, the, the root? I, I get out of my actual information state, I visit virtual information states, which are alternative to each other, and then I converge again to, to my now deeper actual information. Okay? So this is uh, just a thing. What, what do we need in order to make, uh, to add to those rules, in order to make uh, a complete system for classical propositional logic? We need all these rules, it's a trivial one, I hope it's taken by by uh, by others. If I can show B from A, if I show B from not A, I see it to with N is married, N is not married, then I can show Sorry, there's a missing conclusion, of course. I can show B this chart in A and that. Okay? And what's the depth? Yeah. It's simply measured by uh, the, the maximum number of nested applications of this rule. You don't have to consider different things. So there's only one rule that manipulates the virtual information. And the uh, maximum times, the maximum number of times uh, that, uh, that you need, or, or less than sorry, the maximum number of nested applications of this rule that are needed, needed to obtain the consequences and measure of the depth of the inference. Okay? And um, just one thing, uh, 
how this applies to, to uh, our presentation theory should be kind of obvious. I mean, we might uh, think that in fact we want our implementation frameworks to be populated by death bound arguments, right? Because agents are bound. Okay? Can we do that? Can we do that and still preserve the rationality postulates that I showed you, not in detail, but you know, and make something which makes sense from the point of view of rationality? Okay, forget about this. Before I have minutes, right? This is uh, an interesting example. This is a, a, a true, a true uh, piece taken from the one of the Leo's Bibles. So, uh, you know that Salviati in the Leo's Bibles uh, is, uh, is uh, the, the, the character that plays the Leo. <coughs> Whereas Simplicius is the guy, uh, is a caricature of my story. So, here is the, 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 the piece of one of his dialogues in which uh, Salviati, which is Galileo, who is Galileo, uh, refutes Aristotle's theory of falling. Bodies, okay? So what does he do? Okay, so like, of course this is a, a reconstruction which is not the real place that is much more complicated. Uh, also because it's an ancient Italian. It's Dear yeah. Simplicius, you and all have the theory that the speed of falling models is proportional to their weight. I mean, I mean, take the two falling models I and B, if A and B, if the weight of A is greater, it's still the weight, and the weight of B, then the speed of A must be still this was I thought of it. We now know that this is not true. Uh, and Leo pretended that he had shown this empirically by uh, dropping things from the Indian Tower of Pisa, but now historians say that it's not true. Like Leo was uh, an obvious person, really. <laughs> he was a really a political person. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and in fact, you can do it creating a, a void artificially, and then you want to do it now and see that a failure. And the bomb would be glad to catch the ground exactly the same time. No, of course, then there was no way of doing it. And uh, so this was basically an isolated theory of the of device in cases. So, Santiago, which is very late, said, okay, Sinclair, would you never agree with me on the following assumption? If two bodies that the truck, it's very nice, if two bodies traveling at different speeds are tied together, Okay. Then the faster will speed up the slower, and the slower will slow down the faster. It's like uh, we are climbing and we are tied together. If I'm faster than you, okay, of course I, I, I'm uh, uh, speeding you up, but, and you are slowing me down, right? So uh, and uh, and so the, the, the thing is, if you tie if you tie two bodies together uh, with a heavier than me, we tie them together. Of course. Uh, the speed of A uh, would be uh, greater than the speed of A plus B, of, of the two points that are tied together, which would be greater than the speed of B. Okay? Because it's an intermediate. I mean, B is uh, uh, speeded up by, by A, and A is slowed down by B. Okay? So it's intermediate. And simply, you know, says, okay, I have no way, so it's a English implementation test. It means I have no way. To, to reject, uh, to, to, go, to, you know, to attack this, uh, this, uh, this assumption, okay? which is an argument with the result of one assumption. Alright? So, Salviat, so, yeah, then I saw the theory simple system. For clearly, A and B, once tied together, make a heavier body there. Okay? So, according to the result of theory, we should add that A plus B, which is heavier than A, should be, the speed of A plus B should be greater than the speed of A. Whereas before, you agree with me that the speed of A plus B should be smaller uh, than the speed of A. So there is a contradiction. So what's happening here? How is Salviati winning the argument here? He's winning the argument about using a premise P to which he commits that this, this one, okay? The, the, the two bodies tied together uh, take an intermediate speed between the heavier and the lighter, okay? And, uh, and, and simply just has no way to argue with this. Okay. Then uh, he, he says, okay, then I show you that by putting together my premise P with your idea, uh, with, with your um, assumption, which is Aristotle's theory, I get the consistency. Okay? So, using a premise P, what, what, what is the way in which Saviat is doing Using a premise P, which he commits, and see this is an angel assuming for the sake of the argument, I concede to you that the transfer field is correct. 
I show that the conjunction of the two is inconsistent. And so, if you cannot really attack, uh, uh, because you have no reason to disagree with my premise, the premise to which I commit, uh, there is no way I will have to give up. Okay? And uh, so, in fact, this is why we Sunday won't deal with game up recently in a paper that has just uh, uh, been published in artificial intelligence. But in fact, it is interesting and useful. I don't know if there is a way of reducing this to a simple kind of argument, and I suppose not. But it, is not. Uh, uh, it is useful to look at Ragnar as a cheap or rather as a pair. Usually, it's such a recommendation as uh, Francesca showed to have the pair, the premises, and the conclusion. Okay? But here we have the cheap one. We have a set of premises, assumptions that need to put some of the argument commits to, a set of suppositions. What we call supposition, assumptions that occur as premises in arguments put forward by the opponent. Sorry, uh, five, of course, I think it's uh, right to say. Is the conclusion, we might even be contradiction, that we like in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the levels. So basically, what's the attack in this particular case? I mean, we have two arguments that are two triples, gamma, delta, phi. Gamma prime and delta prime psi. So these are my premises, and delta are the suppositions I can see. Okay? And the same with the other argument for, 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 for another agent. Okay? We say that A attacks B on the sentence alpha, which belongs to gamma prime, which is one of the premises again. Okay? Uh, belongs to gamma prime, one of the premises of, of the argument of this attack. Okay? Uh, if uh, the suppositions I'm making for the sake of the argument are included in, uh, uh, sorry, A attacks B on alpha with respect to an extension, because what people do when they argue and they try to build up extensions, right? So in some sense they have to commit not only to the premise, to the premise of, the, of the single argument, but in some sense to the premise of all the arguments of the extension they are trying to build up, right? And you can say, okay, I have uh, yeah, because if you're attacking another argument, another argument in my extension with other premises, I have to defend it. So I mean, I have to be all the facts. So if my suppositions are included in the premises of the extension that you are trying to construct, that is uh, the more general case, but uh, the less case is a uh, simple special case, then this is an attack, okay? Even when phi is uh, the symbol that denotes the relation. What happens, just to move it faster, the given uh, uh, suitable single properties of this argument that we call dialectical, uh, we can actually uh, come up with what uh, we call the partially instantiated part uh, argumentation. Which means we don't have to construct all the new arguments, any subset that satisfies uh, these three simple properties. Okay? Uh, okay. Of course, for more details, uh, interested in the technical paper. And um, any subset, even five of course, of arguments that satisfies these premises, uh, 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 sorry, these properties I meant. Okay? And when I say any final subset, I might mean, for instance, that there are only arguments up to a certain depth, right? I don't have to construct all possible arguments. I can say, okay, let's, let, let's, let's be honest with my students, let's construct all the arguments of the zero, okay? And then that would be a, a, a partial instruction argumentation framework in which all the arguments are that zero. And they do satisfy this properties here, right? And for every subset that satisfies those properties, the rationality postulates that I showed you before, before I had the other group, Kanye, and Paul Dunn, are all satisfied. And so we have actually uh, another result that uh, if uh, um, as the kind of natural reduction I showed you uh, that allows us to measure the depth of an argument, it's used. It's a very simple, uh, uh, well, the proof is difficult, but it's a very simple notion of uh, normal proof that can be easily automatic that uh, automatically satisfies also the normal determination process. I mean, there's no way in which you can get contaminated by using that. This is uh, was shown recently in a paper which is going to appear as the I think uh, it's okay, so maybe not, 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 much, not much practice, uh, unfortunately, but uh, I hope uh, to 
Thank you. Thank you.